Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming uh, to see me speak today. Um, thanks very much for having me. My name is Michael, or Mike, whatever, I'm easy. Um, I have come technically with Angelina, um, who I'll be telling you about a bit more later. Um, I'm a PhD student and now officially a full-time researcher and scientist at Goldsmiths back in London in the UK. Um, and I have a confession to make. This talk started off as a very simple talk about some research that I'd done. And then the more I wrote it, the more I thought about the kinds of things that are really important to me. And then it turned into a very philosophical talk about why I think procedural content generation is so important. And it's a little bit awkward because Paul, uh, at the end of his talk, said he wasn't saying that generation should be used everywhere. And um, I'm going to now claim that actually it should be. So I have a very official, formal aims for this talk slide. And there's just one bullet point on it. I want to make your games worse. Um, and if, you know, even if just a few of you go home today and you make your games worse as a result of the things that I'm saying to you, um, I will feel like I've achieved something, just one or two of you. Um, and just bear with me, OK? Because by the end, I'm hoping that statement's going to make sense and you're going to feel like that you want to go home and make your games a bit worse than they are now. Before I dive into the talk, I do want to talk about Angelina, because I'm going to assume that no one knows who I am, um, because that's probably safest. You might have heard of Angelina before, but the odds are you haven't heard of me. Um, so for the last three and a half years, I've been working on a piece of software. And that software is called Angelina. And it's made stuff like the things that are on this slide, 3D games, simple platformers. Um, and Angelina started with a discussion in my supervisor's office, and he asked me this question, can you generate games automatically? And some people had looked at this question before. Um, other researchers, they'd looked at it in different ways. We wanted to put our own spin on it. Uh, we're interested in whether software can be creative on its own. To actually be a designer like I'm sure many of you are, and, and certainly all of those uh, fine people in the back of this room, and design games on its own. And after three and a half years, this is my thesis. It's the word probably with the question mark after it. Um, because, well, Angelina produced some things which look like games. Um, whether or not Angelina is an independent creative game designer, I don't think so quite yet. Um, if you get bored with my talk at any point, and you have a laptop with you with internet, which I'm not sure whether we do, but you can find all of the games I'm going to show you at gamesbyangelina.org games. But I just wanted to show you some screenshots. This was the kind of games that we started off making. Uh, this is a game called Revenge. It's a very basic, very simple 2D game. This is one of the first things that Angelina produced um, that I was getting it to make. Um, and they were very basic. You'd move these blobs around, and when the blobs touched other blobs, different rules would fire. And Angelina would design different parts of the game and make sure that they worked together OK. Oh, fine, nothing spectacular. Uh, then I started to look at, OK, can we get Angelina to theme its games around things? Put a bit of paint on there, actually make it look like it's about something. So this guy, this slide doesn't work quite as well outside of London. Uh, but this guy is a British politician called Peter Mandelson. Angelina was given the ability to make games out of newspaper articles. So I gave it an article about uh, deforestation in Indonesia. And it found images and music and sound effects and a bit of text. It would write about why it had chosen these images. Like, why is, does he look so grumpy in this photograph? It's because Angelina thinks that people don't like this guy. Uh, he, they've got a negative feeling about him on Twitter. This is OK. Like, it's interesting to me philosophically. People come up to me and they say, you know, this game isn't very good. Um, I don't know what they think I do when I go home in the evenings. Like, I play great games. I know what a good game looks like, and, and this isn't it. But it's interesting from a philosophical perspective. It's, you know, I'm slowly moving it forwards. OK. If you've heard about Angelina in the last few months, you might be more familiar with this. Um, Angelina now makes games in 3D. Um, I ported it to Unity, built some new bells and whistles onto it. And most importantly, it can now take phrases and words as an input. So you can ask it to make you a game about fishing. And it won't be a very good game. But you no longer have to give it newspaper articles to ask it to make a game. Um, and that meant that it could enter game jams, game competitions. This was its entry to Ludum Dare back in December last year. It came 500th in the jam. So 
really we're a long way off any major prizes, but this was a big achievement for me. I, all I did was I gave it the same phrase that I had to enter Ludum Dare with, and after you know, whatever amount of time it took, uh, it produced this game. Um, so it's, it's baby steps. And I just want to give you the obligatory diagram about how this kind of system works, um, because it's going to pay into what I'm going to mention in a minute. So Angelina has lots of different components in it. So there's a level design component, for instance. And when this level designer produces something and it wants to know if it's any good, it calls on all the other parts of Angelina and it says, just give me your best examples of like a rule set and a layout and a theme. And then I'm going to mix this together into a temporary game and I'm going to play it. And the questions that it's asking is not, is the level good, but is the game that results good? And what that tells it is, if we assume that the rule set was OK and the layout was OK, how appropriate is this level design for Angelina? And it feeds this data back. Here's what the game was like. And then the level designer can improve and tweak what it does. So this is like a, a potted history of Angelina. And we did some other stuff. And this was a side project that I'm going to come back to later called A Puzzling Present. But basically, my main message here is that uh, Building Angelina has meant coming across tasks that I didn't expect to come across. I was in love with procedural generation before I started working on Angelina. But when you try to design whole games, you realize that, oh, uh, I need a system that can name these things in a way that makes sense. And ah, I, I can't take it for granted that Angelina knows how the real world works. So when you play Super Mario and you eat a mushroom, someone out there who designed that bit of that game knows that you know that mushrooms are food. Food is good for you. If you touch a mushroom, it's like you've eaten it. Angelina doesn't know any of that stuff. And suddenly, all of these problems are popping up out of nowhere. And it was just interesting. Asking stupid questions like, can a piece of software design a game, reveals to you interesting technical problems that are fun to solve. And I often ask lots of questions in my talks. And it makes it sound like I have the answers to them. I actually don't. I don't have answers to most of the things I'm going to talk about today. But what I'm hoping to do is convince you that finding the answers to them and investigating them and building games that investigate them is a hell of a lot of fun. To give you a little taster of something that's a bit weird, it's not something standard like generating levels, I built a game called A Rogue Dream. This was like a side project away from Angelina. I built it for the seven-day roguelike competition uh, back last year. And the idea behind A Rogue Dream is that at the start of the game, you give it a noun that tells you what you want the game to be about. So I gave it cop, in this case, or policeman. And so it goes onto the web. It finds a picture of a police car. That's going to be the player. What do police hate? What's their enemy? Well, lawyers, right? So let's get a picture of a lawyer. This is the lawyer from The Simpsons. That's going to be the enemy. Uh, what kind of things do cops do? Well, they shoot to kill, right? So that's one of the abilities that you have. You can shoot at the lawyers and kill them. OK. It, that's not the most sane game in the world, but it, it almost gets there. There's something going on. So how did we generate this? Well, there's a great researcher in Dublin in Ireland called Tony Veal. And he realized that if you ask Google a, a question and you don't finish it, it'll give you answers. Um, so it'll say, why do game developers hate the PC? Uh, I, this is a bit of an old result, obviously. Why do game developers need publishers? It's a bit awkward as well um, with some publishers here today. Why do game developers make exclusives? And the interesting thing about this is these are questions that people have asked Google. But they also tell you that people wouldn't ask those questions if they didn't think they were true. So it tells you that, well, if game developers hate the PC, maybe we could make the PC the enemy in our video games. And that's how we get lawyers as the enemy of policemen. Um, or if they have this ability of making cheat codes, maybe cheat codes is something that a game developer could carry around in their inventory. So it's a very toy kind of thing. Here are some examples. If you, you can play as a cat. Cats hate water, so their enemy is a big water drop. They carry fleas around with them. Um, if you're a cow, you can moo. Uh, you don't like red, so it, it found a picture of some red shoes to be the enemy. Or journalists. Journalists can plagiarize. They carry coffee with them. They can lie. Um, and at the time, they, the, the Syrian conflict was in the news. Why do journalists hate Syria was one question that was coming up a lot in Google. So the enemy is the Syrian flag in this case. So some kind of unusual things that comes up. So the point is that there's a lot of things that can be generated. But why do we want to do it? And I know that 
a lot of you will have written procedural generators or you're interested in procedural generation. Maybe some of you have never heard of it before. I'm not going to go over in, in gory detail the history of, of procedural generation. I'm going to condense it into two slides. And they're the obvious two slides that I think everyone uses. It's just because it's at the forefront of my mind right now. I'm writing my thesis. So. Procedural generation, uh, the, the other thing I want to say is that everyone has a different way of describing the history and the use of procedural generation. But here's my claim. We started off using procedural generation to solve problems. I call this needs driven. So this is Elite, which is a game from the 1980s. It was a space trader slash pirate slash fighter slash explorer game. And these galaxies that were in this game were generated procedurally. So the resources they had on them, the sizes, the names, and they were generated because of a need. You couldn't fit this data on the disks that the game was shipped with. But over time, the procedural generation's relationship with games changed. It became part of the culture. It became something that people were interested in. They wanted to have procedural content generation in their games because we saw it as something fundamental to games and being a gamer, um, at least in some parts. So this is obviously Minecraft. And, and I think Minecraft is a really obvious example of procedural generation these days. This castle wasn't procedurally generated, but the landscape around it probably was. The hills, the rivers, the lakes. And I want to talk about pushing this further, what comes after once driven. And I want to start off not by talking about Minecraft, but by talking about this game. This is Spelunky. Is there anyone who hasn't heard of Spelunky before? OK. So Spelunky is an, I'm going to call it an action platformer. Uh, it was originally developed as kind of a PC um, demo game uh, by Derek Yu. He then developed it into a fuller game, which was released on Xbox and PS Vita and all manner of things. Um, and it's a really fascinating game. And I, I think it's probably one of the most important games in the last 10 years um, for what it's done for the culture of games. It's just, it just represents some really interesting things to me. And one of the th interesting things about it is that its levels are procedurally generated. So this is a zoomed out level of Spelunky. Um, and you start at the top here. So uh, you're the little chap. I don't know whether you can see him. You don't need to see him. All you need to know is that you start here. And this red box is like the size of a screen. And you have to get to the exit. And the exit's always at the bottom of the level. And so in order to get there, you're going to take some kind of roundabout path. And the way that Spelunky's levels are generated is really interesting. Um, this come, all of the, these drawings here come from a blog post by Derek um, called The Full Spelunky on Spelunky. And it's really worth reading. So first, the system chooses a start and an end point. And it knows that that's where it's going to be. And then it plots a path. So it says, OK, you're going to go right, and then drop down, and then walk across, and drop down again. And once it reaches the end, it, any place that hasn't been filled, well, we don't care what's in that. Just put some random stuff in there. So then you've got these, this kind of basic template. But you've got to fill it with something, right? So here's the clever bit. Derek has hand designed a bunch of tiles that are the size of a screen. So we've got two ladders here and some blocks in the middle. And each one of these tiles is tagged with where you can enter and exit it from. So this one, you've got entrances on the left and right. And you can also exit beneath as well. So when the system sees something like this, all it has to do is look at each um, path on the path from the start to the exit. What do you need? Do you need an exit from the left and below? Or do you need an exit from left and right but not below? But here's the great bit. Then the system embellishes each tile. So it adds on extra blocks without changing the pathfinding, adds maybe some spiders and enemies, some spikes and treasure. And what this means is that you can play these games, and you can see the same base tile multiple times. But you may not realize it because of this clever uh, trick. And I was really impressed with this. I really love this, this technique. Um, if you get the time, you should check out this website. Um, a guy called Darius Kazemi uh, was so in passionate about Spelunky that he broke down its level generator and built an interactive HTML5 version. You can click tiles to regenerate them or regenerate the whole map. And it really shows you how elegant and interesting this algorithm is. Um, here's a quote from Derek Yu. And again, I really highly, highly recommend this post. I wanted the basic interactions in the game to be simple and few, but allow for a lot of improvisation. And I wanted there to be a lot of chances to improvise. 
in the blog post, Derek expands on this, and he says that he used to play a lot of platformers when he was young, and he really liked them. But the problem with him was that platformers encouraged you to memorize static things and play them over and over again. So a lot of you, if you've ever played the first level of the first world of Super Mario, you remember exactly what you've got to do, where the enemies are, where the mushroom's hidden, where the secret one-up is. And he wanted to get rid of that. He wanted it to be about, oh my god, I've got to think fast because I've never seen this situation before, no matter how many times you play the game. So here, procedural generation wasn't a technical need, just a technical need. It didn't just make the game easier to develop. It wasn't just a cultural thing that people liked having infinite levels. It made the design of Spelunky possible. Spelunky wouldn't be Spelunky if it didn't have procedural levels. And that's really interesting to me. And when you become a scientist, by the way, you, you write a contract. And one of the things on the contract says every presentation you give has a graph in it. So this is today's graph. Hello. Um, we're going to come back to this graph multiple times. So you're going to feel really cozy, and, and it's going to feel very warm and, and welcoming by the time we come back to it at the end. But it's, it's very simple. The y-axis is awesomeness, which is a technical term. I don't know whether this is a familiar thing in game development. A lot of scientific papers on awesomeness. Um, and then on the x-axis, how independent is your software? So how much freedom do you give it? How much do you trust it to develop parts of the game for you? And I've put Spunky completely arbitrarily this far across the graph. I'm going to say it's pretty awesome. And I think it's really great. So the thing is that climbing up this, this, this slope is, is pretty scary. Um, it's very intimidating. And it's intimidating because we, we don't want to lose the quality of our games, right? We really respect games, and I, and I think Spelunky embodies this perfectly, where the game is able to generate stuff for you, but you never lose the sight of what the designer wanted. It's always there. It's very safe. Spelunky is always Spelunky, no matter how many times it randomly generates a level for you. But there are things that Spelunky can't generate. It can't generate this. This is kind of obvious, right? This is going back to Minecraft. So if you look at this image, we've got nice rolling hills uh, at the bottom of the image, some trees, this beautiful lake that feeds out into the ocean in the distance. There's a, a, a cliff overhang, and in the middle of the cliff, there's a little waterfall falling down into the lake. And this is really amazing. And the reason why Minecraft's generator can do this is because you know, it generates levels in a different way, a, a finer level of detail. And you might feel like this is a totally unfair comparison. Minecraft system is more free, but obviously it doesn't always produce good results, um, unlike Spelunky's, where the results are pretty much always what you want them to be. A lot of Minecraft worlds just look like this. They're just empty expanses, flat, a few flowers here or there. And you'll walk for a bit, and there'll be a gigantic cliff face. And you spend five hours mining through it, and then you find more flat grass. Um, and sometimes it just produces stuff that's just completely broken. So this is from um, an earlier version of the generator. And you'll see that these cliffs aren't connected to the floor in any way. There's no way this could exist in real life. And many players of Minecraft don't mind. This is not a problem, because it's a, it's a game. It's a fantasy world. You want it to look amazing, to look interesting. And I don't have a problem with that either. Um, but maybe if you did want it to produce really accurate natural landscapes. You wouldn't want it to produce stuff like this. Sometimes it makes mistakes. But my message to you today is that not only is that OK, but it's probably a sign that they're doing something right. Minecraft pushes to give the system more freedom and more independence to create infinite procedural worlds. And sometimes that means you get duds out. But that's a good thing. So let's go back to the graph again. So what I'm going to claim is that Minecraft's a little bit further than Spelunky on this graph. And what happens is you get a bit of a, a, a peak, which I'm calling Mount Spelunky. And if you keep giving your system more freedom, it gets harder to control. And what happens is the awesomeness of your game begins to dip a little bit. Because it's harder to make sure that you're not going to accidentally generate an expanse of nothing, or a cliff that's hanging out of nowhere, or a floating tree. So. Why is Spelunky Spelunky, and why is Minecraft Minecraft? Why is it that Spelunky restricts itself, and, and Minecraft maybe doesn't as much? Well, failure is super scary, um, particularly, I would imagine, 
if you're taught game design or game development, or if you read about polish and about releasing a game and making sure everything's OK, if there are any designers in the audience, which I imagine there are, you might feel like it's your job to make sure that everything's all right when the player plays your game. It's, it's kind of your duty to make sure that the player has a good time. And procedural generation is kind of the opposite of that. It's like you, you haven't finished your game yet, so you're going to hire someone to go into the player's house and finish the game while they're playing it. And you need to trust that person that they're going to do a good job. And as Minecraft shows, sometimes they do a better job than you could have done. And sometimes they do a worse job. So the question is, where do all of you go on that graph the next time you're building a game or a prototype or a jam thing? Well, I think you've got two choices. So I'm using a mountain climber metaphor for absolutely no reason whatsoever. One choice is that you can look at where Minecraft is on this slope leading down into a very scary place. And you can say, I don't like the look of this. I know how to make games. I'm going to back up to where Spelunky is. And I'm going to use my knowledge of what makes a good game to make a good procedural generator. So let's look at some examples. Ed McMillan's The Binding of Isaac. Um, this now costs like $2 uh, in the sales. If you haven't played it, please, please play it. It's a fantastic game. It's kind of, I've called it a Zelda-like, so it's inspired by um, this particular kind of dungeon uh, traversal. And you can, you can kind of see here, my cursor doesn't show up, but that's OK. You might be able to see that this, this room is kind of templated. There are some blocks in very regular positions. Um, and this will be part of a larger map, which you can see in the top left, where these tiles that Ed has designed are connected to each other, They're kind of in the way like Spunky is. Um, there's lots of randomness in here, random distribution of enemies and items and things like that. But it's very much got that flavor of Spelunky, regular tiles, dependable things. Um, what about Borderlands? So with Borderlands, you've got these, these guns, millions of them, potentially. Um, and they're built by having very dependable effects that someone has decided is an interesting thing for a gun to do, um, values like damage and accuracy. And then they're kind of randomly assembled together. And then you have a gun. And this is a new gun that no one's seen before. But I kind of know, I know that it's going to be OK, because I know what all these effects do. I know what all these values do. I've set sane minimum and maximums for them. It's going to be all right. But you, know, you can probably tell that there's an or or a but coming, um, because I don't think we should go that way. I think we should do the other thing. I think we should take the plunge. I think we should dash past Minecraft veering down that slope into the dangerous territory of negative awesomeness. This is a game called Lena's Inception. It's developed by a British developer called Tom Coxon. Um, and it's absolutely brilliant. It's, it's also inspired by Zelda. It's a procedural Zelda-like game. This is actually a picture of its overworld. This is procedurally generated with castles and forests and lakes. And every time you play the game, you can generate a new one if you want. Um, and it also generates its dungeons and puzzles in the dungeons. And I just wanted to zoom in a bit, um, because the world generator makes mistakes right now. So you can see that these roads sometimes just end in trees, or they're blocked off by bushes, or there's bits of lake in the middle of nowhere, and, and entrances that are kind of blocked off or in a funny angle. The roads look like they've been laid down by someone who'd had a few too many drinks the night before. But the point is that this system has so much freedom. It has the freedom to do this. And that also means that when Tom has fixed it and made changes to it and tweaked it, it will have the freedom to produce amazing, interesting, varied, unusual things too. Um, and I highly recommend taking a look at Lena's Inception if you're interested in procedural content generation. What about Borderlands gun generation? Well, I wrote on my website about two researchers called Eric McDuffie and Alex Pantelev. They did this experiment where they built a system that tried to evolve new designs for guns. And they did this by having a, a huge amount of variation in the properties that these projectiles could have, and the guns, and the physics systems. And then people played this game. And depending on which guns they used more, depended on which ones they wanted to continue with and got selected. And here's a quote from the paper. An interesting weapon that the game generated had a projectile speed slower than the running speed of the player. Um, as well as like a low gravity and very high damage. And what, initially, they thought this was going to be junk, because what would happen was the player would fire the gun and then walk into their own bullet and die, because it was slower than they were moving. But as this gun stayed in the pool of being used, 
they realized that actually people started using it differently. And suddenly, this was a weapon that you could use to lay down minefields behind you. So you would turn around and lay down a field of these very slow floating bullets and then switch to another weapon and face in front of you, and you knew that no one could approach you from behind. So this is a, a gun that came out of this experiment that the designers of the experiment initially thought was useless, and they were surprised to find uses for it and purposes for it afterwards. So these are some ways in which you can dive headfirst down that hill. But you might still not be convinced that there's any reason to actually do that. So I've, I've, by the way, I've put Angelina on this graph now. I'm going to argue that Angelina is a lot less awesome than Minecraft and Spelunky. And if you've ever played any of its games, I imagine you'll agree. But I'm also going to claim that it's more independent. I've given it more control over the game's designs. Um, so I know a little bit about what it looks like to plunge down that slope head first and be a little bit worried about where things are going. There are two ways that you can read this graph. You can think that it continues like this, with the dotted line off into negative infinity awesomeness, which uh, is a terrible place that no one should ever go. But I want to tell you today that it doesn't go like that. The graph looks like this. It goes upwards instead. You reach a point where the independence of your system gives you the power to do things that you could never have done yourself without handing over control, um, as Paul said, to this procedural system that you, that you built yourself. And that's why we, I, I now want to talk a little bit about this, because this is the thing that convinced me of how true I, I believe this, this is. Um, this was a game I built about a year and a half ago called A Puzzling Present. And all I was responsible for was the art, which is amazing, thank you very much, and um, the UI, the menu system. Angelina designed the levels for the game, and it also invented the game mechanics, or some of them at the very least. The aim of this system was to generate verbs. This is a new word that I've learned to use instead of mechanics. So I've learned the difference between them. Um, and I didn't mention this at the start, but those games I showed you, that arcade game, those platformers, um, they worked a little bit like this. You'd have rules, and the rules were like, when some type of object touches another type of object, you apply some effects to them, and you change the player's score. So if the red blob touches the player, kill the red blob and give the player five scores. That's points. Um, and whatever, the reds are collectible items. It's a very basic kind of rule. But what this is, is this is like Duplo. Um, I have no idea if Duplo is a cultural touchstone that works in any other country. I've got a thumbs up, fantastic. So you know, you, th these are fairly chunky blocks that you give to small children. Some of them are already in the shape of things. You know, there's, a, there's a block that's in the shape of someone's head. And so eventually, you're going to make an animal if you stick enough of them together. right? And I wasn't very happy with this. So then we moved on to a different type of game. And this time, we were generating power-ups. So Angelina had access to a fixed number of variables in the game that I'd chosen, like jump height or gravity. But this time, it could change it to any value it wanted. So it could set the jump height to be 500 pixels or 423 pixels. And remember, it's also designing the levels. So as it was doing this, it was saying, OK, the player can only just reach this part of the level, but not the rest of it. So if they want to find a power-up somewhere in here, then they can reach the rest of the level. And Angelina could design simple progressions this way. And this was a bit like moving from Duplo to Lego. So it's a little bit more grown up, but ultimately, it still feels like I'm just giving Angelina things that connect to each other. The, the choosing of jump height as something that is interesting to change, that was the creative bit. And I was doing that. Angelina was doing a much easier task of just finding the right value for it, right? I, I, I've begun to make games myself at this point, And I came to the realization that this is not how I write code uh, for games. And that's because it's, it's missing this important thing. I write code. I, I don't use these building blocks that I plug together. I work at a, a finer level of detail. and so. This is the kind of thing I wanted Angelina to come up with. This is uh, some Flixel code, but uh, you know, you'll be able to translate it into whatever you use. Uh, when the space bar is pressed, get the player's velocity and give them a boost upwards. And that's your jump button, right? 
So there's a pattern here. There's some kind of variable that's been selected, and there's some kind of change being applied to it. And this is not very complicated. These are very, very, very basic mechanics. But this is what I wanted Angelina to be able to do. I didn't want to handpick variables like I'd done in the past, where I'd said, oh, the lock status, nudge, nudge. This is important, by the way, Angelina. So you should fiddle with this, because you'll find something useful here. Because this is the Lego problem, right? Instead, I wanted to give Angelina access to everything in the game. I wanted it to be able to look through the entire code base and find things to change, change them, and then see what the impact was. Because this is what I have access to. I have access to all of these lovely variables when I'm making a game. And, and I write code that's more complex than just x equals y. But sometimes it's not more complex than that. What can Angelina find? So we built a system that could find game mechanics that look like this. If the X button is pressed, then do something. Assign some variable to some, some value to some variable. And this is you know, pushing Angelina down that slope, pushing it further to the right. But as with all systems that take that route, it gets a bit dangerous. So these are genuine examples of things Angelina came up with. If you press X, you lose all your health. It's, uh, might leave that one, I think. Um, if you press X, you can't jump anymore. I wasn't a fan of that one either. That didn't go well, down well in playtesting. Um, if you press X, the height of the player becomes negative, so the renderer can't draw the sprite on the screen anymore, and it crashes, and the whole game shuts down. And you think that your Mac's broken, and for a while, you get extremely worried. So not, not the best, again. But this is what happens when you give a system access to a game's code base. It randomly messes up stuff. So, come to this age-old question of how do you stop this system you've made from making bad things? How do you stop the trees from floating in the air in Minecraft and so on and so forth? And there are two solutions to this problem I'm going to tell you today. The first is just not to make bad things. And this sounds stupid, but this is actually exactly what Spelunky does. If you remember back to this original diagram, at every stage, Spelunky has a level that's playable. It adds a tile connected to the start tile, and it knows that you can access it through that side of the tile. Then it adds another one and another one. And at every stage, it knows that it is leaving the player with a level that is playable. And even in the extremely rare circumstance that it's not, one of the abilities of the player in the game is that you have a bomb that you can drop, and it blows up part of the level. So Spelunky just doesn't make bad levels. But we want our systems to be independent. We want them to have the chance of failing. What I want to do is I want to make a system that makes bad things, that makes rubbish, and then recognizes that and either fixes it or makes something else. And this is often referred to as generating test. Uh, certainly in academic papers, I don't know how well known that, that term is, or even if it's a good term. But, uh, but the thing is, how do you test a game mechanic? I mean, if you were making a maze, for instance, you might have some ideas for how you test that, right? Maybe it's the distance from the start to the finish, or how many dead ends there are. But some things are difficult to test. And this is what's interesting about doing the kind of research I've been doing. How do you test a game mechanic? Or how does a piece of software test a game mechanic? If any of you have worked on games yourself, you will have ideas for how to test game mechanics. You ask people. You play them yourself. You bring the games to expositions like this, and you show it to people. But Angelina doesn't have any understanding. It didn't grow up playing Mario, and it doesn't have any friends, unfortunately. So I ruled out the idea that Angelina would be able to work out what's fun. Um, it might be able to one day, but I've given up on that for now. It's, it's a very difficult problem. What about meaning? Well, I gave up on meaning at that time as well. We're beginning to look at that again, but it's a really difficult problem. Angelina doesn't understand that roses smell sweet or that a uh, big red heart means you love someone, or that war is a bad thing. Um, it can find this information out, but it's not going to have the same emotional connection that, uh, that we do to it. But machines are really good at working out when something's useful. That's what a lot of AI is about doing. It's about optimization. So maybe usefulness was something I could use. Maybe Angelina would be able to work in this way. So. And this is, you are privileged. I finally got around, it's only taken me a year, to making these slides with Santa on them and stuff. They used to just be red and black boxes, and it looked incredibly ugly. And I, I didn't want to do that to you. So this is the level that Angelina used to test its mechanics on. And it's unsolvable. 
this is not like a grand mathematical problem. It's just that Santa can't jump high enough to get over that thing in the middle to the present, right? So Angelina can simulate this game, and it can tell you, yeah, I can't solve this. Um, I can't jump high enough. I can't do it. So then what you do is you take one of these mechanics that it came up with, setting the player's health to zero. You add it to the game, and you now say, OK, can you solve it now? Try and solve it with this mechanic. Obviously, the player health being set to zero isn't going to be uh, a very good one. But what about this one? This is one that Angelina came up with. Take the y component of the player's acceleration and multiply it by minus one. Now, in Flixel, if you want to set gravity for something, you use the acceleration vector. So you set it to a positive value, and they get pulled down. So when Angelina uses this game mechanic, oh, suddenly it's sucked up to the ceiling because it's flipped gravity around the other way. And now the simulator can say, well, now I can walk around on the ceiling. I can walk to the right-hand side. And now if I press this button again, suddenly I'm on the floor. And then now it's reached the exit. And it knows that it couldn't have reached the exit before. And the only thing that it's changed is that it added this tiny bit of code. So if it can reach the exit, well, that bit of code must have been what let it do that. And when that happens, Angelina catalogs that bit of code, it shoves it away somewhere. And um, this was how we came up with the mechanics for a puzzling present. But you know, inverting gravity is, is not super interesting for two reasons. One, you probably know of games that have used it before, such as Terry Kavanagh's VV, VV, VV. And that was actually the second reason why it's not very interesting, is that I was thinking of this mechanic when I designed this system. So I was expecting to find it. What about things I wasn't expecting? Well, it turns out that Flexel has a feature in it called elasticity. Every object in the game has it. Um, and if you fiddle around with the elasticity of something, it becomes bouncy. Now, I didn't know that this existed in Flexel. Um, I'd used Flexel for two years, but I'd never come across this feature. And in the API, if you look at it, it says, experimental, do not use. Um, and that's because if you set it too high or too low, people start bouncing off the screen and, and awful things like that. But Angelina found a way of using it. It noticed that if you bounce for a while, so you, I'm going to enable it now, and now I'm bouncing, I can actually use it to bounce to higher heights um, over ledges, over dangerous holly, you can reach the exit with it. And it's super basic. But the important thing is I didn't know this existed. If I was designing this system as the Borderlands gun generator, and I'd given it little bits of code to reuse, I would never have given it this, because I didn't know it existed. Maybe that's not enough for you. What about this? Angelina came up with a very basic mechanic, uh, teleportation. So you press a button, and Santa's here, and then suddenly he moves a fixed distance to the right. Yeah, it's all right. It wasn't mind-shattering. Um, but Angelina was also able to generate levels for these games. So I said, OK, make me some levels that use this mechanic and show them to me. And they come back, and it shows you like a picture of the level and then a description of how it solved the level. And it was wrong. The solution didn't make any sense. And this really worried me, because um, I would stupidly, as you can see, I themed the game around Christmas. That meant it had to come out in the middle of December. And I was freaking out, because everything was breaking. So. I dived into the code base. What's wrong? Why is this solution incorrect? But it wasn't incorrect. It took me a day and a half to work out. But here's what had happened. Angelina, during simulating this teleportation mechanic, noticed the following. If you jump up and then teleport, and you end up inside a wall, you might think that, well, that's it. You can't move anymore. That's game over. But there's a bug in my code, the bit that I'd written, the bit where you jump. And what it says is that. As long as you're touching the floor, as long as your feet are touching something solid, you can jump. No one minds. So Angelina says, well, fine. I'll teleport inside a wall, and then I'll jump out of the wall. And I'll teleport back inside the wall again. And it had managed to work out that you could climb up walls using this teleportation mechanic. This took me a day and a half to work out, and it exploited an error in something I'd done. It used a mechanic it invented and then designed levels that used an emergent property of this mechanic in their solution, and it confused its creator. And this is the point at which I was converted to the idea that generating things opens your eyes to things that you never, ever would have seen otherwise. This graph where you get 
some returns, then a big drop, and then this big question mark at the end. In computational creativity, we call this the latency problem. And as a fellow researcher of mine called Alison Pease, and she describes it in this really nice way. She says it's a bit like learning a foreign language. When I was in my French lessons in school, my French teacher would ask me very normal sentences. What did you do at the weekend? I would always say I played football, even though I never had, because I knew how to say it. And you're good at French in that lesson. You're where Spelunky is. And then you go to France for the weekend with your parents. And suddenly, you're out in the real world, and you, have, you need to know how to ask for things. And you need to know how to understand these verbs that you've never heard before. And the quality of your French suddenly drops. But you're actually a better French speaker. You're more independent. You're learning new things. And eventually, over time, you regain control, and you end up being a fluent speaker. Um, and I've been embarrassed today at how fluent everyone is in English, and I, I can barely speak a word of, of their languages. Um, but what I hope is that this is the same for software. And that's what we believe. The more independence that you channel into your software, eventually, we will cross over this valley and find out what's on the other side. Now, no one knows what's on the other side of that valley. It probably isn't a crappy platformer game about Santa, unfortunately for me. But the thing with uncharted territory is that we need people who are brave and or stupid enough to go and find out what is over there for us. Just like exploring new worlds was centuries ago, it's not going to be comfy, and it's not going to be glamorous, and there's going to be a lot of pain. And more importantly than anything else, you're going to make a lot of stuff that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And originally, this slide said the word crap instead of crazy, weird, and nonsensical. And I dressed it up a bit. But you're going to make a lot of rubbish. You're going to make stuff that you show to people, and they don't understand it. Or it, it works in the hotel room the night before, and then you bring it to show to a journalist, and it produces something nonsense. But I can promise you that you'll see new things. You'll see things that no one else has ever seen before. You'll do things for the first time. And the thing is that there's a lot of ways to get to the future of gaming. Um, there's a lot of different the meanings for that. But I really believe that one way we can find that future is by giving more generation, more procedurality, more independence to our games, to our game systems, to our middleware tools. I want you to come with me. I want you to come with me and find it. And uh, if you do get there, let me know. Um, before I tell you how you can let me know, I want to thank Tom and Derek for letting me use some of their illustrations for this talk, and also to Azalea for pretty much everything since Angelina started, um, and also to Tony, who did some great work um, helping me out with things like A Rogue Dream. But you can read more. Every fortnight I used to, I, I've stopped doing it lately. I write about other academic work, researchers that have found ways to invent new role-playing game classes, um, people who generate guns for first-person shooters, the RPG class experiment, it came up with a class of a uh, hero where his whole purpose was to apply loads of auras to himself and then run into the middle of a group of enemies and die, and the auras would spread out around him. This was a whole class around that, and, and their system was able to invent it. It's just amazing stuff, and maybe there'll be something in there that inspires you. But whatever happens, let me know how you get on. Let me know failure or success. I'm at MTRC on Twitter or Mike at gamesbyangelina.org. And the only other thing I have to say is, yeah, go home and make your games worse. Um, and then in 20 years' time, everyone will be thanking you for it. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Apologies for being a little bit short. Oh. No problem. So you have some time for questions, I think. Anybody? Yeah. Hi. Testing? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, what do you think about Proteus? Okay. What do I think about? Proteus. Um, I think Proteus is, I, I use Proteus a lot as an example because I often speak to people who think that games are Call of Duty, and that's it. So Proteus is a great example just for that reason. But I think Proteus is an interesting example of how, and I didn't get to mention it, but how 
procedural design can also be an extension of the person that designs the system. Um, maybe, I don't know if Ed and David would agree, but I feel like in Proteus, they really have built a person that goes into your home and finishes the game for you. It kind of expresses their um, vision of what the game is. Um, but I think, I always feel very nervous when I talk about artistic things, because I'm not a very artistic person. But I think Proteus shows maybe a little bit of what's over that hill in terms of an, in, in an artistic sense, and how you know, people might think that in order to produce a piece of art, you need complete control over it. Um, but Tom, who spoke here last year, Tom Betts, and, and I believe Ed and David would feel the same, is that they're just living examples of how you can produce something artistic and beautiful and not have any control over what comes out of it. Um, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Proteus. Thanks. Hi, um, you mentioned something, uh, you very, very quickly mentioned that you were looking back into uh, Angelina creating meaning mm. uh, in her games. What, what are you looking at? I mean, specifically, I'm curious. It's, that, that's a very good question. Let me see if I can find a uh, talk that I gave. Uh, I can't, so I'm going to just tell you. Um, so meaning is really tricky um, because, as I said, we we grow up we grow up knowing that if you if you drop something, it falls, and that's the basis of all platformers. And I can't even tell Angelina that. Um, and there's a bit of a debate whether should I tell Angelina that mushrooms are food, or should it find out that mushrooms are food? And there are many different ways of doing it. And I decided to cheat. So I wrote a paper last year, and there's a talk on my website I put on YouTube, where I said one of the, maybe the way that I'm going to do this is not tell Angelina and not have Angelina work it out, but have Angelina invent meaning. So let's say it wants to make a game about fishing, and it wants to convey the fact that people catch fish, but it doesn't know what this word catch means. So it looks through its index of mechanics, and it says, OK, when fish run into the wall, they're going to disappear forever. And that's going to be what catching means. And you think, this makes no sense at all. And then Angelina makes another game. And this time, it's about police chasing robbers. And when you want to catch a robber, you have to push it against the wall, and then it disappears. Because Angelina sees the word catch. Police catch robbers, people catch fish. And then you think, well, OK, well, that still doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But I can see that Angelina has an understanding. I can see that there's a link between these two games, and it understands it in the same sense. Um, there's a lot of things that are interesting to me about computational creativity that might be boring, which is why they're not necessarily in this talk. But um, things like the perception of creativity is very important. It, it doesn't, th there's no definition of creativity. It's about what you feel when you see Angelina. And I think things like consistency, things like, ah, I can see a pattern here. Angelina is thinking in, about things in some way. That's really valuable, even if it makes no sense. That's my belief. But I am yet to confirm that theory. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I think that's super interesting, because um, being able to create something that has a completely different viewpoint um, to humans, to us, because yeah, it would, it would essentially create games that we could never even thought of. Uh, and I think that's sort of an in, uh, that, that would be more interesting rather than creating something that emulates what a human could design. And I was just curious about that. Thank you very much. That's a great viewpoint on it as well. Um, and I wanted to go back to, oh, I've lost it, but uh, A Rogue Dream, which was the game I showed at the start, where it made games about the cats or game developers. And the interesting thing there is that it has the ability to challenge your understanding of the world because it's finding other people's opinions or it's mixing opinions. And yeah, I, I absolutely agree. within the next decade that game devs are going to be competing with programs like Angelina? Um, so there's two parts to that question. First is in the next decade. Or maybe, maybe. 20 years, I don't know. Foreseeable future. Some of them might be. They won't be competing with Angelina, because Angelina will be making crazy stuff that doesn't make any sense. But some people will be competing with some systems, but probably not in the way as you think. People will really underestimate the value in our connection to human beings. Um, I'm not, this is not a plug or anything, but Reyes or Royce, I think I might be pronouncing it wrong, Abbey Games is a beautiful game. 
I, I bought that game and I played that game because I get a sensation that someone like me has produced it. Um, they see the world in the way that I do, not because our political views are the same, but because they're a human being. And people really value that connection to something that's been created. That said, um, sometimes journalists try to get me to say this, and then I regret saying it later, but I'm going to say it again. Um, maybe some people might find that they are competing for a particular type of game, so abstract puzzle games or very simple um, kind of casual games that are on Facebook. I could imagine someone generating those one day. Um, I still don't think most people have anything to worry about, though. Um, even in that case, it's polish is a really difficult thing. There are a lot of people here who will know exactly how something should sound, should sound um, when a particular action happens. And it's really difficult for intelligences to do that. Um, I think it's more likely that they'll open your eyes to new problems that humans can solve. <laughs> So you talked about procedural generation in games. Uh, what other areas of computational creativity are very inspiring to you and maybe for other game developers? I absolutely should have. I normally include a slide, and I wish I had now. Because the amazing thing about computational creativity is that it touches almost everything. And I have written about it on my site in the past. So um, the obvious ones, narrative, music, um, artwork, um, even things like jokes. There's a Twitter bot called The Joking Computer, and it tweets one joke a day, and it is almost always awful. But occasionally, it's very good. But then you get the stuff. The stuff that I really like at the conferences is not like narratives or music. Someone will stand up, and they'll say, I built a system that invents soup recipes. And like instantly, I put away my laptop, tell me about this story. And yeah, the guy put his recipes up online. And the system didn't understand. Um, it understood how to make recipes, but it would say things like a dash of bacon or um, a sprinkle of potatoes. And it didn't understand it. And the best part was they put these recipes online without telling people what they were on like a food.com website. And people were like, what the hell is this? What are you doing? Like They were rating the reviews really low. But then they actually cooked the recipes, and they brought them along to this um, church event where you know, people were sharing soups and stuff. People really loved them. Um, I really like fun stuff like that. I, maybe the next cooking mama. I don't think that's going to really that kind of research is necessarily going to work for games. But I do think that there's a lot of work in narrative generation, and there's a great tool. Um, I don't have a slide for this. So just everyone remember this metaphor magnet. You should Google it. It can tell you things like what do people think about a word. Angelina knows that people feel scared by cults because Metaphor Magnet tells it, because it's mindless information. What, what kind of metaphors do people make about coffee? It's dark, like the night. Um, I think there, there are games in these tools. I think there are games waiting to be made out of these amazing web services and tools. Um, I do have some links on my website, but yeah, oh, there's, it's a mine out there. There's so much stuff. I'm really excited. It's a really exciting time to, to be doing this kind of thing. How do you uh, test uh, or simulate generated games? Is it done automatically or by hand? It's done automatically. Angelina plays them out, um, which is extremely time consuming. Um, at the moment, when it plays the game out, it's asking questions that I've given it. So I say, look, when you're playing this game, make sure that you don't die instantly. Make sure there's a way to get to the exit, and so on and so forth. And what I hope at some point in the future this is one of the things I'm thinking about a lot, is to get Angelina to decide what it wants to look for when it plays this game. Um, of course, the other thing which, which people suggest a lot is that you do what all of you guys do, which is use playtesters. Um, so what I'm hoping sometime soon is that Angelina will have an email address. It will send out builds to people who have agreed to play them. They'll fill in very simple surveys, you know, one to five, something that Angelina can understand. And they'll email them back to Angelina. I won't even know it's happening. And over the course of a week, it'll run QA testing on its own. And yeah, I'm hoping to grow that part, because evaluation is really important. Um, otherwise, it's, it's 
kind of a blind sort of generation, a bit more like uh, a Spelunky, I guess, or a Minecraft. Is it uh, simulating, like doing that automatically, not uh, the same as making the game? Because then you also have to uh, make AI for, the, for testing the game. You, so it can be. Sometimes, like you say, you're kind of making an AI that plays the game. And, and what's interesting about a puzzling present, which I'm now building into Unity, is that you can't write an AI for it because it's got mechanics in that you've never seen before. How can you write an AI that knows? So what it actually does is it, 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 there is no intelligence, not intelligent at all. It presses every button it can trying to solve the levels. Yeah. And, and as far as I know, there isn't really an alternative apart from like intelligent general games playing because you want it to find things that you didn't expect. So you can't write an AI for it. And that makes it a little bit tricky. Um, it makes it all entertaining to watch as well. Um, you can watch it on Unity as it tries to solve this level. Um, so it, it's something I'm looking at a lot. The mechanic generation is one of the most exciting things for me. Uh, yeah. Thank you. We have time for one more question. I will be around today, uh, and please email me as well if you ever want to talk about anything, really. Well, thank you. Give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs>